Welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report for April 2016, Entertaining the American Army. I'm your host, Dennis Skupinski. During this program, the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, was the instrument that was used to bring entertainment to the American soldiers overseas. A century ago, April 1916, saw the end of the Fokker Scourge, the Fokker Eindecker which revolutionized aerial warfare by having a synchronized machine gun fire through its propeller, was being equaled by Allied planes which could do the same and started to become faster and more maneuverable than the Germans. On April 1st, the British forces on the Tigris River in Mesopotamia, which is now modern-day Iraq, renewed their attempt to break the Turkish lines and relieve the besieged garrison at Kut al Amara. This was the third attempt to relieve Kut. On April 4, 1916, the Russians appointed General Basilov to command the southern forces. On April 11, 1916, Portuguese troops occupied Kionga in German East Africa. On April 12, 1916, the first of many clashes took place between the U.S. Army and the Mexican Army, or the Federales. The U.S. troops remained in Mexico to mop up the remnants of Pancho Villa's supporters. These troops increasingly came into contact and armed conflict with the official Mexican troops sent by President Carranza of Mexico. These clashes led to the very real threat that a war could exist between the U.S. and Mexico. On the stormy night of April 14th, 15th, 1916, three aircraft of the Royal Navy Air Service bombed Constantinople and Adranople, operating from Mudros. Two aircraft of Flight Sea attacked the powder mills and gun factory, while a third aircraft bombed the railway station at Adranople. The bombers were BE-2Cs. On April 20th, 1916, Russian troops from the Far East arrived at Marseille in France. They would fight on the Western Front. They'd become known as the Russian Legion. On April 20th, 1916, a number of events happened in Ireland. The first was the landing of Roger Casement by a German submarine. He was captured four days later on April 24th. Another event that happened on April 20th in Ireland was a scuttling of the ship that was called Alt. The Alt was actually the SS Castro, which was a British cargo ship captured by the German Navy. The Germans used the ship to run guns to Ireland to help with the rebellion. The ship looked similar to the Norwegian ship Alt and was sunk by her crew on April 20th off the Irish coast, 1916. On April 24, 1916, the Easter Rising or Eastern Rebellion took place in Dublin, Ireland. It was organized by a seven-man military council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Patrick Pierce led a small band along with a smaller group of Irish Citizen Army of James Conley and the women of the Cumann Band. The Rising was launched by Irish Republicans to end a British rule in Ireland and establish an independent Irish Republic while the United Kingdom was heavily engaged during the First World War. It was the most significant uprising in Ireland since the Rebellion of 1798 and the first armed action of the Irish Revolutionary Period. On April 25, 1916, the Germans sent a fleet of battle cruisers with accompanying destroyers and cruisers commanded by Rear Admiral Frederick Baldecker to bombard the coasts of Yarmouth and Lostov. Although the ports had some military significance, the main aim of the raid was to entice defending ships to sail, which then could be picked off either by a batter cruiser squadron or the full high seas fleet. On April 29, 1916, in Kut el Amara on the Tigris River in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, Sir Charles Townshend became infamous. It was the single largest surrender of British troops in history to that time, over 13,000 troops. They were seized for five months by the Turkish and German forces. Entertaining the American Army, 
This program is about the men and women who entertained the service personnel throughout the First World War. Since no organization existed at the time, the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, took over the operations and organized entertaining troops throughout the world. There were two men from the very outset that were responsible for the YMCA conducting the entertaining of American troops. They were William Sloan, Chairman of the War Work Council of the Young Men's Christian Association, and his General Secretary, Dr. John R. Mott. The YMCA had the task of organizing the largest entertainment enterprise in the history of the world up to that time. It gave over 109,000 separate performances to the soldiers with approximate attendance overseas of over 87 million, while at home over 40 million. It also gave overseas 157,000 movie showings, showing more than 8 million feet of film. The aggregate attendance between April 1918 and July 1919 was over 94 million, and these were at over 5,200 different places. It is estimated that the gross attendance for these motion picture shows reached over 210 million. It gave performances by stock companies and performances by soldier shows throughout the area of the American Army. It organized four great play factories, which were centers for rehearsals and costume equipment. It improvised plays and vaudeville acts. It provided overseas alone 23,000 costumes and accessories, 18,000 musical instruments, and over 450,000 pieces of sheet music. It also took over and managed the leave areas behind the lines, with the largest number of theaters, casinos, and amusement halls ever administered under one management. American troubadours were professionals, semi-professional, and amateurs who followed the army through the war. Like the soldiers, they did their duty to the end. They were all volunteers, all 35,000 of them. The adventures and experience of these entertainers gave a deep insight into the most human side of the war. There were tales about life aboard ship, nights on submarine seas, the first hours ashore at base camps, the journeys into the bleeding heart of France, and the last march on the road to battle, from trench to stevedore camp, from leave areas to great supply centers, in dugouts, ruined chateaus, cathedrals, barns, village squares, and trucks backed against barns, these couriers of cheerfulness and sanity and courage sang the American army on to victory. Entertainers were from a broad spectrum of the profession, Shakespearean actors to burlesque comedians, from classical singers to the juggler, ventriloquists, chalkologists. No one could set a limit for their enthusiasm or devotion. One little jazz dancer whose lightning steps brought her to a complete exhaustion after a single performance in America, coming across a trainload of forlorn, show-hungry soldiers, gave this amazing dance 18 times at different sections of the train, and then exclaimed, All right, go on with the war. <laughs> Head of the entertainment organization was William Sloan, chairman of the War Work Council of the Young Men's Christian Association. The chairman of the Overseas Entertainment Bureau was in command of recruiting and movement of the entertainment army across the sea to France. This was done by Thomas S. McLean. His lieutenant was John Briscoe, command of the forces of the Over There Theater League. In France, the Director General, Overall Operations of the American Expeditionary Force, YMCA, was Edward C. Carter. The entertainers were directed from operations in Paris by three people. One was a Midwestern businessman named Charles Steele, another was Walter H. Johnson, Jr., and the third, one of the most lovable personalities in the whole army, A.M. Beattie, a man who knew more actors and entertainers than anyone who went to France. <laughs> Joe Lorraine was one of the many entertainers in France, entertaining the troops. He was famous for strumming music on his banjo and crooning old plantation songs.
One day, Joe Lorraine was entertaining troops in the hospital when he came across Sergeant Charles Cunningham of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The story of Sergeant Cunningham's bravery is frequently and proudly repeated by American soldiers. He was sent out one night on a raiding party. Separated from his comrades, he encountered eight Huns. Four of these he killed and three he disabled. He crawled back to the American lines, fatally wounded. I was with him on his last conscious day, Lorraine related, and the signature on his banjo was his last bit of writing. Just before he went, he waved his hand to the hospital mates and said, I'll beat you all in New York. And he asked me to play, and I gave him a little Negro melody. Then he smiled and went west. Sergeant Charles Cunningham was of the 126th Infantry Regiment, 32nd Division, Company K, part of the Michigan National Guard, and was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and also the Croix de Gare from France. During the war, Michigan provided over 28 entertainers. One group was called the Khaki Trio, led by Charles H. Forsythe of the 116th Field Signal Battalion. Two of the three members of the Khaki Trio were the Forsythe brothers who came from Lawrence, Michigan in Van Buren County. The Khaki Trio went on tour in Canada, England, Scotland, Belgium, and France. There are no known recordings of the Khaki Trio, but we do have a copy of their sheet music with the official song of the Signal Corps, copyrighted in 1918. The Life of an Entertainer in Paris, the YMCA will take charge of you and tell you what camps you are going to visit first. Most of the camps are not actually in towns, but two to seven miles outside. But the base town is where you will lodge. Some of them are the most interesting historical towns in France and go out by motor to camps themselves for your performances. And when you're given your performance in all those camps near that town, you go back to Paris and get a bath, hurrah, and start for another base town, and so on. You will be met at the station by your local boss, that is the YMCA secretary in charge of the district. About nightfall, he'll load you into an open Ford motor car, so there mustn't be more than six of you in the company at the very outside, and you'll start for a camp to give your performance. All the senior you'll be able to carry ought to be under your hat, and your costume, if you take one, must pack in a flat handbag, otherwise there won't be room in a Ford. But, oh, respect that humble Ford. It cost $1,000 in France and had to be fought for at that. And the gasoline that feeds it can only be had by order from the army, and it's a penal offense to use a drop for pleasure riding. On your way to the camp, your car may be halted two or three times by a sentry, with his rifle really loaded. Halt! Who goes there? YMCA. Pass, YMCA. And finally, you do pass the bounds, and inside you'll find a flat, treeless expanse of trodden mud covered close with the barracks where the boys live. The camp looks like a newly built mining camp without the saloon. Some genius realized what this absence of any touch of home in a soldier's life might mean, and a YMCA in France is a result. Wherever there is a camp, you'll find a YMCA hut or house. There is always a canteen or counter at one end, where they sell at cost the minor luxuries that Uncle Sam doesn't supply, such as cigarettes, hot chocolate, shaving brushes, and biscuits. In some of the more important camps, there are separate auditoriums, except that auditorium is altogether too grand of a word, for they are just like the other huts, except that there are no tables or canteens, and they are just filled with closely packed benches. Sometimes there's a little stage which has a drop curtain. Often, there isn't. Once in a while, the boys have painted a rudimentary backdrop. It almost always represents New York Harbor with the Statue of Liberty. The fact that you are coming to play there will have been chalked up a week ahead of time on the bulletin board outside the hut, and the hut will be packed with boys to welcome you. They will be standing outside the windows as far as you can hear, and if you're late, they will wait. Over there in France, everything about home has come to have a golden halo. You know how it is yourself when you've been away from home a long time. Every man from America seems to the doughboy a kind of messenger and representative of God's country. And every American woman represents not merely a woman, but his own mother, wife, or sweetheart. We of the theater can personally help to speed up the victory. 
because our men will fight better if we keep them happy and content in their exile, and because in addition to the entertainment we can bring, the unspoken message that America is with them and behind them every day and every hour. The service we are asked to do is not a duty, it's a great privilege, and we owe a debt to the YMCA in France, who have asked us to join them in serving our soldiers there, and whose pioneer work has made our service possible.